talking about writing and, and writing subtext. And subtext is so different in movies. And often so much subtext in movies is, is, is sort of created by silence. And it's kind of a, a luxury you almost don't have as much in the theater. If people aren't moving, they almost have to talk. Very often in the theater, though, it, it's the space between the words that where the emotional impact occurs, I think. And I don't just mean pauses. I mean just that that hair's breadth of time when you absorb what I'm saying to you before you come back at me. That's where the relatedness of the character shows up. It's where what we mean to each other shows up, that we don't take each other for granted. We're not inconsequential to one another. You're either an obstacle to me or you're helping me get what I want. So those spaces between the words are where the uh, the unconscious rises to the surface a lot. Uh, yeah, but I just feel like silence is a very different thing on the stage. Yeah, yeah. well, sure. Well, you can show things on film. You can do the insert. I always hate inserts, and I always try to avoid inserts. You tell the audience what, 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 what an insert is. An insert is. is the two people are talking, but then one of them puts something in his pocket, say, and you cut to a tight shot of it going in his pocket, or you cut to a tight shot of it, of the watch going down on the table, and it's almost saying to you, take a look at this, this is going to be important later. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's really sticking it in your face. I, it, on the stage, everything is a wide shot, and you get a close-up only by virtue of focusing the audience's attention on something, and you really is, you really get a sense of, of, uh, close-ups and wide shots and medium shots, depending on how the focus is, is laid on, the, on what's taking place. But because I, I think about this a lot, when I, when I started writing movies, and I, I've written about five movies, I always approach them like plays because I, I came from the theater where... And, and, and Four Seasons is almost an entire cast of theater actors. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there, there are visual things in it, plenty of visual things. But there's a tendency, I think, that's that's um, natural in filmmaking to lyrically tell you stuff visually that's not expressed through character and through endeavor, the character's endeavor to accomplish something. Do you think that's because at heart movies are more dreamlike? In theater? Maybe they are. I don't know. But the fact that oh, I've always I've always wondered about the fact that you watch a movie in the dark on a big screen, and I've always wondered if and this is really just highly specula speculative. I've never read any studies that even approach. Uh, we're from Marie Curie, so go ahead. Speculate. <laughs> uh, the, the idea that you watch it on a big screen, and that is almost almost like a dreamlike experience. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if the same real estate in the brain that you dream with, is that being employed when you're watching a movie? The funny thing is, when you watch television, or at least in the old days when people watched television, it was on a much smaller screen and in a lit room. And there may be something about the difference in the, in the two experiences that account for the fact that movie stars are so much more uh, dreamlike figures for people than television stars are. Possibly, it's not just that they watch the TV stars over and over and start to think that they, that they know them as neighbors and friends. It might be the experience of seeing them. You can see a movie star three times in your life, and they have power over your dreams. Not so with TV people. I, I, th I think one of the things, though, and, and you must have seen this because you moved from, from television to movies, is that... Part of this TV is furniture. It's in your house. You mm -hmm. often are not watching it and concentrating on it solely. The phone is ringing. The yeah. dog is around the house. The kids are there. Yeah. You go to a movie theater, you're making a kind of a surrender to Some the environment. Some people are. <laughs> Many people so, are. So a lot of people, the ones who sit behind me, talk. <laughs> well, you can nowadays text them and tell them to oh, stop that's talking. That's right. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point you bring up. Yeah, it is a commitment. It is, and it's that same thing with the theater. You're going in and you're giving yourself to something. And, and one of the things I guess I, that fascinates me uh, about you doing what you do is that way that you've got to use dialogue to score in the theater to get the audience's attention. Yeah, and I wonder yeah. if that's the thing that maybe appeals to you about that kind of writing. That, I love it. I get, and as I said, I grew up in it. So, But it, you know the thing? It really, we're talking about power, and mm -hmm. it really is about the power of the actor to use mm -hmm. that dialogue yeah. to arrest the yeah, audience's yeah. attention. Yeah. I mean, there, there have been attempts in the theater – to get the audience's attention with uh, scenery and floating chandeliers and helicopters and things like that in, in musicals. 
and and in a way that's that's trying to create a, a spectacle to take the place of the utter fascination that you can achieve with people on the stage with no scenery at all if they're really connecting brain to brain there's nothing more arresting than that and as exciting as many movies have been uh, for me for my taste they don't stand up to a really good play where the actors are toe to toe thinking at each other well i, I saw you in glengarry glen ross and i wondered if you're talking about repetitions, and, and that's one of the things that Mamet really yeah, does, yeah. is that repetition. I wonder if, if working with Mamet's material, that's, uh, that changed the way you saw or underline, italicize these thoughts you had about repetitions in the way and some things No, work. I had these thoughts uh, before I ever heard of uh, Mamet. Um, but I, I do admire his uh, his dialogue. It's very, it's very interesting. It, it sometimes, when you try to learn it, uh, Bill, the actor Bill Macy said... Uh, anybody who's tried to learn a mammoth play eventually wants to commit suicide. <laughs> it's very hard to learn. Is because, it? Why yeah, is it you so know, hard? You know, the reason is that your character will start five sentences and not get past the first three or four words. And they all veer off in different directions. But eventually you realize that they're all heading toward some central idea. And you have to figure out why the person had these false starts and in order to get to the point that they were trying to make. And I've, I've often thought that he, since I did the Glen Gary play, I've often wondered if he, if he didn't arrive at that through improvising himself because it looks like the transcript of an improvisation. The, 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 the brain is trying different ways to get to the point. And, and discarding the ones that don't seem to work the way we do in speech and you don't know you can't, you're not there at the moment of creation you don't know why that character's brain is trying all those false starts so you have to reconstruct it somehow and, and you, you know I had this very interesting experience I was rehearsing Glengarry and I couldn't sleep so I turned on television. I was disturbed. I couldn't. I couldn't figure out how to how to say the dialogue and make it sound like a person. And I saw an old Abbott and Costello movie, and they were doing one of the old routines. One of the routines I had seen when I was a kid, two or three years old, watching from the wings. And I heard the rhythms of this burlesque routine, and I said, "Oh my God, that's Mamet's rhythm." Wow. Isn't that interesting? And that made it much easier for me to, to hook on to it. I think we have a record. The first person who ever to connect Abbott and Costello and David Mamet <laughs> is my guest, Alan Alda. His new play, The Given Playhouse, is Radiance. The Passion Marie Curie. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It's the treatment, which you can also hear at kcrw.com. I happen to see you in uh, the, the, the film adaptation of Pearly Victorious, Gone mm. Are the Days. Mm. So you go to work with two of my favorite actresses, with Ruby D, yeah, and with Diana Sands and the, the Owl and the Pussycat. Which, on the stage. On the stage. Yeah. And as I, the first, probably the, one of the first plays ever to have an interracial relationship mm. in which race was not mentioned. Yeah. And it wasn't mentioned because it wasn't written for a black woman. But, it the, was, but it wasn't changed, though. Wasn't, no, not, not a word. And... Nobody said, well, now that it's a black woman, of course, we have to say this and this and that. And no, it was just she was a, this person. How do people react to that when they, when they finally sank in that there was no mention of race? Did you, did you ever talk to people who said that was kind of a fascinating experience because well, it never came Well, there was one moment in the play where he humiliates her. We're talking about the relationship basically between an inter, a sort of a uh, basically constipated intellectual and, and, yeah. a, and a prostitute. Yeah, yeah. She, 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 he, he's a hyper intellectual not in touch with his with his own body and she's all, all, body. all body and not not in touch with her brain and he tries to educate her but at one point they they have a fight and he humiliates her and a lot of people found that or some people found it offensive because he was humiliating a black woman uh, and it seems to me it would be offensive just to humiliate a woman sure he wasn't. He wasn't presented as as doing the right thing. He was. He was wrong to do it in the play. But they had an extra feeling of um, of, of, of dismay uh, at that. Sure. But we. I don't, neither Diana nor I understood when we started doing it that people were going to think there was something funny about something odd about a romance between these two people. We had worked together in, in an improvising company a year or two before, and we knew each other very well. And um, 
to us, we were, we were trying, trying to figure out how to play these two characters. And, and, and we both started to get hate mail. Not, not an awful lot, but I mean, you know, a few, a few pieces of hate mail where the people just couldn't take it. That, I mean, it, it, it's hard to go back in those times. It, that was only uh, three or four or five years after they were burning churches in the South. It, it's, it's, it's difficult for us now to remember, now, now that we possibly have two black men running against each other for president. But still, I mean, you, you think about how rare it is to see a kind of a racial mix in the play in terms of cast members where race is not an issue, even now. Yeah, I mean, we still yeah. have maybe in some ways the world has changed a lot, but in plays it's very much not it's not about that. And I, I only ask about that because I only came to be a fan of hers in the films because I wasn't old enough to see mm. her on the stage. Mm. But she was such a luminous actress. She really was. She was, and and didn't get the parts she should have got. She should have played Cleopatra, and uh, she should, could could have played a, a dozen other parts that that she would be playing now. I mean, it was a fluke that she played a part. At the time, it was a fluke that she played a part that had been written with a white woman in mind. And, and the producer, Phil Rose, was smart enough and forward-thinking enough to realize it didn't have to be played by a white woman. He didn't have to change any words. That This is a person. But the, getting back to the passion again, so much of what you've done as a writer has been about finding a way to take things that mean something to you, oftentimes issues, and, and burying them in, 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 in the subtext of drama. I mean, that's been something that's kind of been important to you, has it not? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't try to make s- social points or anything. I try to understand human behavior. You know, like for instance, in 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 my personal life, twenty five or thirty years ago, I campaigned for the Equal Rights Amendment, and and have often identified myself as a feminist. But I'm not trying to write a feminist. Tracked. That's what I'm saying. Do you with, bury with, it with, in, in terms of drama? I don't even bury it. I just, I just understand things a little differently. I mean, but there isn't. I don't think there's anybody alive today who will see this play and not recognize the the misogyny in in the way Marie Curie was treated. But as a writer, I I, I don't want to I don't want to make set up any straw dogs. When when people behave badly toward her as a woman, I'm almost always using the actual words they spoke at the time so i'm i'm not uh, i'm not trying to make a uh, uh, set up a straw dog so that uh, so that they can make the point and and i'm not trying to make the point i'm just trying to understand what this person's obstacles were and and make them real and believable so that you have a play that you can watch with mounting interest we're out of time. Alan, thank you so much for doing this. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My guest is Alan Alda. His new play is, which he's written, is Radiance, The Passion of Marie Curie. I just love saying the title, <laughs> which is at the Geffen Playhouse. A recording engineer at KCRW in Santa Monica, who also edits and mixes the program, is J.C. Swadek. The associate producer is Jenny Radelet, Harry Ailes producer. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It's The Treatment. Find past episodes of The Treatment at kcrw.com or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen to The Treatment on demand on your smartphone with KCRW's apps. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica.